Thank you. And uh, I can't see you, which is probably just as well in some respects. Not that that's a problem. You all look uh, fantastic. But uh, that previous talk was a difficult one to follow. But I'll do my best. Anyway, thanks very much for coming. And uh, the title is The Arctic Amplification of Global Warming. And I hope by the end of the next 18 minutes or so, uh, you'll have an appreciation of the fact that the biosphere and the climate system, the Earth system, all interact. OK, and that's very important for us as humankind. I'm very sorry, but this TEDx presentation is not about polar bears directly. Uh, OK, I'll get that over first. It is, however, about the Earth's uh, planetary life support systems. And this is important for our very survival and existence. And I hope you get this message by the end of the, the presentation. So, two facets of the Arctic. It's cold, uh, not all the time. Sometimes the lower picture shows the same location in the summer. It can be up to 30, 35 degrees even in some places, and that's becoming more frequent. But effectively, the Arctic helps to keep the planet cool, and that's very important to note. So the snow and ice cover in the Arctic actually act as very effective reflectors of incoming solar energy. And Nice, pure, clean snow, as it comes in, maybe reflects up to 90, 95% of incoming solar energy straight back to outer space without causing any warming okay, on the planetary surface. That's very different once the snow and the ice goes. So the planet uh, is kept cool by the Arctic and its snow cover and other areas with seasonal snow. The Arctic also stores massive amounts of carbon, huge, huge, huge amounts of carbon, and most of this is below ground. Okay, and that's another important point to note. There's lots and lots of soil organic matter there which is slow to, de to decay, much of which is also frozen still in, in what's called permafrost. But this situation can be changing. Okay. It's warming very fast in the Arctic. That's another point I want to make. This uh, region of the world is, is warming faster than any other part of the planet, um, and two times as fast, in fact, uh, as the rest of the planet on average. So it's changing fast. Um, and this is something that needs to concern us as well. So here is the actual uh, data for the last uh, decade or so, 2000 to 2009. This is the warmth on the planetary surface compared to a reference period of 1951 to 1980 as a baseline. And you can see there the areas that are warming most. Uh, it tends to be in the Northern Hemisphere, around the Arctic Ocean. There's a small area here too as well. I'm going to stray slightly from the spot around the Antarctic Peninsula, which is important too. So it's warming very fast. One of the very, very clear signs of this is actually in the extent of Arctic sea ice. So if I can just point these ones out to you. Uh, this is data that's very hot off the press. This is September the 11th, 2015. And this is satellite-based measurements of the Arctic sea ice here. And the yellow line is the median extent from measurements from 1981 to uh, 2010. And you can see that we're actually, we have much, much less ice this September than we have as the median for this period. And it's the fourth lowest seasonal ice extent. This is this line, the black one here. Okay, so this is through the year. The Arctic sea ice reaches its minimum at the very end of the summer, and then it starts to reappear now as the Arctic uh, Ocean refreezes. So we're the fourth lowest year uh, on uh, the record period now from 1981. So things are changing fast where it comes to Arctic sea ice, and this is another way of representing this. Okay, so things are moving fast. The decline of sea ice cover is striking. There are other things changing, like seasonal snow cover and permafrost melting as well. That's another very striking one. So we have effectively an Arctic amplification of change. So what's warming the planet is be being manifested more strongly in the Arctic, and that's a point that I want to get over. So this is data here uh, for 2001 to 2012 average, and it's compared with data from 1970 to 2000. And this is the actual extent of what we would call the temperature anomaly here. So we've got a lot of warming going on concentrated in the Northern Hemisphere. And we talk as well of something called the Arctic amplification of change. And this relates to feedbacks in the system uh, that exist. One of the obvious ones relates to reflectance, as I've already spoken about uh, very briefly, about snow cover compared, and ice cover compared to other surfaces which don't reflect to the same extent. So as snow and ice melt, darker land and ocean surfaces absorb more solar energy. We have, in the Arctic, more of extra trapped energy because of global warming goes directly into warming rather than causing evaporation. And this is to do with the contrast between ice-covered and snow-covered surfaces compared to moist surfaces with liquid water. 
The atmosphere is also thinner in the Arctic than the rest of the planet, and in the Ar Antarctic as well, actually. It's a thinner atmosphere. So the warming actually doesn't dissipate as much. It's not spread over such a large volume. So we see uh, a greater warming at the surface in, in the Arctic there. And as sea ice retreats, solar heat that's absorbed by the oceans, this is more easily uh, retransmitted to the atmosphere as well. And then we also have potential game changers, actually, in terms of how the system operates, to do with the inputs of fresh water and uh, melting ice, for example, from Greenland into the North Atlantic, which can change things like the thermohaline circulation, so the whole ocean circulation. So there's various hypotheses about, as the Arctic warms, areas such as Northwest Europe could actually become cooler. Uh, so this Arctic warming and mid-latitude cooling is something that people are very interested in at the moment. Okay, so global warming is not evenly spread over the planet, so that's a, perhaps an important point to note. Okay, so I've already mentioned this obvious positive feedback on warming relates to surface reflectance. So the albedo effect, this is the, uh, what this one's called, albedo is surface reflectance, and you can probably make out that this kind of snow-covered surface is very different in terms of reflectivity compared to an open surface where the snow's melted. And how this works is very simple, so if we have one unit of incoming solar energy here onto a snow-covered surface, we might actually straight away reflect 90, 95% of that energy back to space without causing warming. So that's very important. So what's left, the net warming, is relatively limited. However, if we get rid of this snow and ice, we end up with, the same, for the same unit of solar energy coming into the system, we reflect less, okay, back to space, and we correspondingly absorb more. So this is a very straightforward positive feedback, okay, on global warming. So <clears throat> snow and ice melting, very simply, lowers the albedo, the reflectance of the surface is an example from northern Sweden, just a, a, a snow bed melting out in late June, as it does up there. And you can see very clearly that this is a much lighter surface than the surrounding Arctic tundra, okay, which absorbs solar energy much, much more effectively. So we lower the albedo, or the reflectance. That means we absorb more sunlight instead of reflecting it. And that leads to more snow and ice melting. So this is a classic positive feedback on global change. As you can imagine, it's a kind of almost a runaway type process, which sounds a bit frightening. Um, so we need to keep these things in perspective and try and understand them. So put in perhaps a more tangible way, uh, this is just a, a flight over the, uh, the Tombstone Mountains in Yukon Territory in Canada to get to field work a couple of years ago. And not only is it beautiful, but you can see very clearly there that snow-covered surfaces uh, tend to be, and this is late August, and the, the new snow's just appearing, uh, but they tend to reflect much more clearly. Okay, so I think that's, for any of you that have been out skiing and things like that, I think you'll realize that. Okay, it can be quite warm, but the snow doesn't melt that fast. Okay, and this is a, a satellite image here, uh, a co composite made-up satellite image based on real data, which kind of illustrates this kind of shiny surface to do with seasonal snow cover. Okay, and this is really important in terms of the planetary energy budget. And as this disappears or melts out early, we have increasing uh, concerns to, to think about. A less obvious feedback on global warming relates to what I would call biogenic, so biologically formed greenhouse gas emissions. Does anyone give, any, can give, anyone give me an example of a, a greenhouse gas? Methane, great, that's a biogenic one. We all produce that, in fact. Um, Pardon? CO2, that's a great one. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Which end of the cow does mo mo most methane come out of? If anyone wants to be polite, it's its front end, actually. It's called eructation, in other words, belching. Anyway, that's a slight aside. Okay, so we've got greenhouse gas emissions as well, and we both release them through industry and, and, and land use change, but the biosphere also exchanges these gases with the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, taking it in, you and me, through eating our Weetabix this morning, releasing some of that carbon dioxide, at least if you're all alive and respiring, that's what we're doing now. Most of that release back to the atmosphere is done by soil organisms and microorganisms in the oceans. Okay, so that's really important. So we have these exchanges going on anyway, but is there a potential runaway train here? It's something we need to think about. Okay, so and we can forget this, we've already talked about this albedo issue. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about carbon dioxide and methane and organic matter. And I'm doing all right for time, so that's good. Now this is a map, don't worry too much about it. It's a polar projection, this is the North Pole, and all the brown stuff is soil organic matter. 
okay? And the units are very, very high. So the darkest colors, this is per square meter, and this is in the top meter of soil. Uh, there's also more further down, but up to 50 to 100 kilograms of carbon per meter squared. That's my weight in carbon per meter squared. Okay, if you multiply that up to per square kilometer, etc., I think you can see that there's going to be some really big numbers involved in this. Okay, so there's a lot of carbon in these systems. And if you dig a hole, and usually you have to wait until late summer to do this in many parts of the Arctic because it's thawing through the summer from the surface down and it reaches its maximum depth of thaw about now before it starts refreezing from the base and from the surface, there's a lot of carbon in there. It's a little bit like the Scottish Highlands. There are sim similar processes. It's cold and it's damp. So it's anaerobic, lack of oxygen in many places, not all, but in many, and it's cold, and that restricts microbial activity. So decomposition is quite a slow process, okay? And that means that we store carbon. So we've had, over geological timescales, more photosynthesis than respirational decomposition in the system. And so also the added factor here is that as this organic material is added each year, the depth of thaw declines, as that, if that makes sense, because the permafrost table rises as well. So the bottom layer gets frozen gradually as we add more organic material to the top. At least that's the way it's been over thousands of years. So the Arctic stores huge amounts of carbon, most of it in soils. Um, and what we're talking about here is around about 1,400 petagrams of carbon in permafrost soils alone. And one petagram is one billion tons, okay? So I want you to bear in mind those figures. Does anyone know roughly off the top of their head how many petagrams of carbon humankind releases into the atmosphere every year to do with industrial activity? Anyone got an idea? Okay, it's around about nine, okay? It's around about nine petagrams. So that's what we're, we're through cement manufacture, burning coal and gas and, and oil and so on. But we've got this amount of carbon sitting, frozen for now, most of it, in the Arctic, potentially waiting to go into the atmosphere if things change. This amount is equivalent to 155 years' worth of current levels of fossil fuel combustion. Okay, I want to make that point. This is really, really important. So if we think about this biogenic feedback, just trying to place it a little bit more, more clearly here, we've got, as surface temperatures increase, I've got a sort of very simple diagram here from a, a recent uh, paper from last year from environmental research letters, but as the surface warms, our thaw layer or depth increases okay, through time. This blue stuff is permafrost, so it's not water. Okay, it's just frozen ground, which is sediments of soils, organic material, dead animal and plant remains from thousands of years locked up in this. So as this active layer deepens, as the surface warms, then what actually happens here is organic matter thaws and it also decays. So if it's changed from being stored in ice, in other words, in the deep freeze, and it's thawed out, then microorganisms can get to work on it. If there's no restriction in oxygen, then the greenhouse gas that's mostly going to be released is carbon dioxide, but if it's waterlogged, then fermentation happens, and that's a gas called methane, which is released. So we can increase the amount of carbon dioxide and methane released to the atmosphere, which, of course, can be significant in terms of global warming, which leads to greater warming. So this is another positive feedback, okay, on warming, which is slightly worrying. Okay, new analysis, this has just been published in the last week, of the effects of melting permafrost, and this is in, in one of the nature journals, in the Arctic points to 43 trillion US dollars worth of extra economic damage, okay, to the planetary system by the end of the next century. 43 trillion dollars, okay? eye-watering sums of money, but if you think of what underpins that, it's climate change, and it's not just effects in the Arctic, it's effects in low-lying countries around the world in terms of sea level, in terms of crop failures, in terms of extremities of weather and that kind of thing, are all linked to this. And this relates to this melting of permafrost. This picture is just from one of my sites in Canada, and this is uh, obviously living vegetation, but just 30, 40 centimeters below, this is an ice lens, this is solid ice here. This is melting now, and there's organic material which is being released for decomposition. Okay, so 
it's something we need to be careful about. In terms of thinking very, very quickly about uh, how it looks when we melt permafrost, we get manifestations like this of massive ice exposure. This is in northwest Canada on Herschel Island. This is ice. This is organic material, organic material in the ice as well. And this is how it, how it basically eats back into a slope as the active layer deepens and the permafrost thaws. The whole surface can slide off. Okay, so this is on, again on Herschel Island. The width of this is 400 meters, okay, and all basically ending up in the sea. So here's just a quick uh, video of what that might look like. So this is almost in real time. Okay, if you look at the actual timing here, you can see the, the whole slope okay, is moving down slope because of deepening of the active layer. So as this material actually moves down slope, where it ends up is critical, okay? Because if it ends up in a lake or a river, it's carried downstream, then it can ferment in the bottom of a lake, okay? So I think you can see here, this is a very, very rapid process. You can see it pretty much with, with the naked eye, okay? Now, if we actually think about where that organic matter ends. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. A molecule of methane is 25 times stronger than carbon dioxide. Oh! Methane is formed in millions of lakes around the Arctic where permafrost is thawing. And each year, these lakes are emitting already tremendous amounts of methane. But when we look at how much carbon is in permafrost still frozen, and the potential for that permafrost to thaw in the future, we estimate that more than 10 times the amount of methane that's right now in the atmosphere will come out of these lakes. Okay, so that was just perhaps one of the more extreme examples, but that's real, that's not made up. That is methane being produced at the bottom of a lake there because of organic material that's been delivered, it's been eroded off the land surface and ended up there. It's fermenting, and the ice layer puts a cap on that, so it builds up under the ice, and that's it. And this is, this is replicated over vast, vast areas. So just to wrap this up, I hope it's uh, something that will get you thinking. That's the main thing here. Next time you see film footage of a polar bear struggling across thin sea ice, bear in mind that that's what polar bears have been doing for tens of thousands of years. Okay, that's part of the deal when you're a polar bear. Okay, I want you to see beyond some of the headlines, and when you see icebergs falling into a fjord and things like that, often these are media pictures of global warming. That's again a perfectly natural process. Okay, it happens. That's how icebergs are formed. Okay. So if you think beyond the headlines, that would be fantastic. The Arctic's a key part of the Earth's planetary life support system, and we depend on it. In terms of atmospheric chemistry, another message I want you to go away with is that it's as important as tropical rainforests in its influence on atmospheric chemistry and climate. Okay? It's as important as the tropical rainforests. There are feedbacks in the climate system that relate to biological processes. Okay, so biology is critical, so any of you that are thinking of studying biology or do, keep on. It's really important that we understand these processes right down at the field level. And the atmosphere and the biosphere are very strongly linked, so we are all in this together. Okay, and that, with that message, I will stop and I've run out of time, so thanks so much to the organisers, fantastic, and also to Lee for the audiovisual and for the opportunity to speak to you, and thanks for, for listening. Thank you very much.